Chapter Thirty Seven of Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Thirty Seven. The subject continued. In the first place, and as a matter of the greatest necessity, we are bound to describe how a house may be got for nothing a year. These mansions are to be had either unfurnished, where if you have credit with Messrs. Gillows or Bantings, you can get them splendidly monté and decorated entirely according to your own fancy, or they are to be let furnished, a less troublesome and complicated arrangement to most parties. It was so that Crawley and his wife preferred to hire their house before mr bowles came to preside over miss crawley's house and cellar in park lane that lady had had for a butler a mr raggles who was born on the family estate of queen's crawley and indeed was a younger son of a gardener there by good conduct a handsome person and calves and a grave demeanour raggles rose from the knife-board to the footboard of the carriage from the footboard to the butler's pantry when he had been a certain number of years at the head of miss crawley's establishment where he had had good wages fat perquisites and plenty of opportunities of saving he announced that he was about to contract a matrimonial alliance with a late cook of miss crawley's who had subsisted in an honourable manner by the exercise of a mangle and the keeping of a small greengrocer's shop in the neighbourhood the truth is that the ceremony had been clandestinely performed some years back although the news of mr raggles's marriage was first brought to miss crawley by a little boy and girl of seven and eight years of age whose continual presence in the kitchen had attracted the attention of miss briggs mr raggles then retired and personally undertook the superintendence of the small shop and the greens he added milk and cream eggs and country-fed pork to his stores contenting himself whilst other retired butlers were vending spirits in public houses by dealing in the simplest country produce and having a good connection amongst the butlers in the neighbourhood and a snug back parlour where he and mrs raggles received them his milk cream and eggs got to be adopted by many of the fraternity and his profits increased every year year after year he quietly and modestly amassed money and when at length that snug and complete bachelor's residence at number two hundred and one curzon street mayfair lately the residence of the honourable frederick deuceace gone abroad with its rich and appropriate furniture by the first makers was brought to the hammer who should go in and purchase the lease and furniture of the house but charles raggles a part of the money he borrowed it is true and at rather a high interest from a brother butler but the chief part he paid down and it was with no small pride that mrs raggles found herself sleeping in a bed of carved mahogany with silk curtains with a prodigious cheval glass opposite to her and a wardrobe which would contain her and raggles and all the family of course they did not intend to occupy permanently an apartment so splendid it was in order to let the house again that raggles purchased it as soon as a tenant was found he subsided into the greengrocer's shop once more but a happy thing it was for him to walk out of that tenement and into curzon street and there survey his house his own house with geraniums in the window and a carved bronze knocker the footman occasionally lounging at the area railing treating him with respect the cook took her green stuff at his house and called him mr landlord and there was not one thing the tenants did or one dish which they had for dinner that raggles might not know of if he liked he was a good man good and happy the house brought him in so handsome a yearly income that he was determined to send his children to good schools 
and accordingly, regardless of expense, Charles was sent to boarding at Dr. Swishtail's, Sugarcane Lodge, and little Matilda to Miss Peckover's, Laurentinum House, Clapham. Raggles loved and adored the Crawley family as the author of all his prosperity in life. He had a silhouette of his mistress in his back shop, and a drawing of the porter's lodge at Queen's Crawley, done by that spinster herself in India ink, and the only addition he made to the decorations of the Curzon Street house was a print of Queen's Crawley in Hampshire, the seat of Sir Walpole Crawley, baronet, who was represented in a gilded car drawn by six white horses and passing by a lake covered with swans and barges containing ladies in hoops and musicians with flags and penwigs indeed raggles thought there was no such palace in all the world and no such august family as luck would have it raggles's house in curzon street was to let when rawdon and his wife returned to london the colonel knew it and its owner quite well the latter's connection with the crawley family had been kept up constantly for raggles helped mr bowles whenever miss crawley received friends and the old man not only let his house to the colonel but officiated as his butler whenever he had company mrs raggles operating in the kitchen below and sending up dinners of which old Miss Crawley herself might have approved. This was the way, then, Crawley got his house for nothing. For though Raggles had to pay taxes and rates, and the interest of the mortgage to the brother butler, and the insurance of his life, and the charges for his children at school, and the value of the meat and drink which his own family, and for a time that of Colonel Crawley, too, consumed, and though the poor wretch was utterly ruined by the transaction, his children being flung on the streets, and himself driven into the fleet prison, yet somebody must pay, even for gentlemen who live for nothing a year, and so it was this unlucky Raggles was made the representative of Colonel Crawley's defective capital. I wonder— how many families are driven to roguery and to ruin by great practitioners in Crawley's way? How many great noblemen rob their petty tradesmen, condescend to swindle their poor retainers out of wretched little sums, and cheat for a few shillings? When we read that a noble nobleman has left for the continent, or that another noble nobleman has an execution in his house, and that one or other owes six or seven millions, the defeat seems glorious even, and we respect the victim in the vastness of his ruin. But who pities a poor barber who can't get his money for powdering the footmen's heads? Or a poor carpenter who has ruined himself by fixing up ornaments and pavilions for my lady's déjeuner? or the poor devil of a tailor whom the steward patronises and who has pledged all he is worth and more to get the liveries ready which my lord has done him the honour to bespeak when the great house tumbles down these miserable wretches fall under it unnoticed as they say in the old legends before a man goes to the devil himself he sends plenty of other souls thither Rawdon and his wife generously gave their patronage to all such of Miss Crawley's tradesmen and purveyors as chose to serve them. Some were willing enough, especially the poor ones. It was wonderful to see the pertinacity with which the washerwoman from Tooting brought the cart every Saturday, and her bills week after week. Mr. Raggles himself had to supply the green groceries the bill for the servant's porter at the fortune of war public-house is a curiosity in the chronicles of beer every servant also was owed the greater part of his wages and thus kept up perforce an interest in the house nobody in fact was paid not the blacksmith who opened the lock not the glazier who mended the pane not the jobber who let the carriage nor the groom who drove it 
nor the butcher who provided the leg of mutton nor the coals which roasted it nor the cook who basted it nor the servants who ate it and this i am given to understand is not unfrequently the way in which people live elegantly on nothing a year in a little town such things cannot be done without remark we know there the quantity of milk our neighbour takes and espy the joints or the fowls which are going in for his dinner so probably two hundred and two hundred and two in curzon street might know what was going on in the house between them the servants communicating through the area railings but crawley and his wife and his friends did not know two hundred and two hundred and two when you came to two hundred and one there was a hearty welcome a kind smile a good dinner and a jolly shake of the hand from the host and hostess there just for all the world as if they had been undisputed masters of three or four thousand a year and so they were not in money but in produce and labour if they did not pay for the mutton they had it if they did not give bullion in exchange for their wine how should we know never was better claret at any man's table than at honest rawdon's dinners more gay and neatly served his drawing-rooms were the prettiest little modest salons conceivable they were decorated with the greatest taste and a thousand knick-knacks from paris by rebecca and when she sat at her piano trilling songs with a lightsome heart the stranger voted himself in a little paradise of domestic comfort and agreed that if the husband was rather stupid the wife was charming and the dinners the pleasantest in the world rebecca's wit cleverness and flippancy made her speedily the vogue in london among a certain class you saw demure chariots at her door out of which stepped very great people you beheld her carriage in the park surrounded by dandies of note the little box in the third tier of the opera was crowded with heads constantly changing but it must be confessed that the ladies held aloof from her and that their doors were shut to our little adventurer with regard to the world of female fashion and its customs the present writer of course can only speak at second hand a man can no more penetrate or understand those mysteries than he can know what the ladies talk about when they go upstairs after dinner it is only by inquiry and perseverance that one sometimes gets hints of those secrets and by a similar diligence every person who treads the pall mall pavement and frequents the clubs of this metropolis knows either through his own experience or through some acquaintance with whom he plays at billiards or shares the joint something about the genteel world of london and how as there are men such as rawdon crawley whose position we mentioned before who cut a good figure to the eyes of the ignorant world and to the apprentices in the park who behold them consorting with the most notorious dandies there so there are ladies who may be called men's women being welcomed entirely by all the gentlemen and cut or slighted by all their wives mrs firebrace is of this sort the lady with the beautiful fair ringlets whom you see every day in hyde park surrounded by the greatest and most famous dandies of this empire mrs rockwood is another whose parties are announced laboriously in the fashionable newspapers and with whom you see that all sorts of ambassadors and great noblemen dine and many more might be mentioned had they to do with the history at present in hand but while simple folks who are out of the world or country people with a taste for the genteel behold these ladies in their seeming glory in public places or envy them from afar off persons who are better instructed could inform them that these envied ladies have no more chance of establishing themselves in society than the benighted squire's wife in somersetshire who reads of their doings in the morning post men living about london are aware of these awful truths 
you hear how pitilessly many ladies of seeming rank and wealth are excluded from this society the frantic efforts which they make to enter the circle the meannesses to which they submit the insults which they undergo are matters of wonder to those who take human or womankind for a study and the pursuit of fashion under difficulties would be a fine theme for any very great person who had the wit the leisure and the knowledge of the english language necessary for the compiling of such a history now the few female acquaintances whom mrs crawley had known abroad not only declined to visit her when she came to this side of the channel but cut her severely when they met in public places it was curious to see how the great ladies forgot her and no doubt not altogether a pleasant study to rebecca when lady bearacres met her in the waiting-room at the opera she gathered her daughters about her as if they would be contaminated by a touch of becky and retreating a step or two placed herself in front of them and stared at her little enemy to stare becky out of countenance required a severer glance than even the frigid old bear acres could shoot out of her dismal eyes when lady de la mole who had ridden a score of times by becky's side at brussels met mrs crawley's open carriage in hyde park her ladyship was quite blind and could not in the least recognise her former friend even mrs blenkinsop the banker's wife cut her at church becky went regularly to church now it was edifying to see her enter there with rawdon by her side carrying a couple of large gilt prayer-books and afterwards going through the ceremony with the gravest resignation rawdon at first felt very acutely the slights which were passed upon his wife and was inclined to be gloomy and savage he talked of calling out the husbands or brothers of every one of the insolent women who did not pay a proper respect to his wife and it was only by the strongest commands and entreaties on her part that he was brought into keeping a decent behaviour you can't shoot me into society she said good-naturedly remember my dear that i was but a governess and you you poor silly old man have the worst reputation for debt and dice and all sorts of wickedness we shall get quite as many friends as we want by and by and in the meanwhile you must be a good boy and obey your schoolmistress in everything she tells you to do when we heard that your aunt had left almost everything to pitt and his wife do you remember what a rage you were in you would have told all paris if i had not made you keep your temper and where would you have been now in prison at saint pelagie for debt and not established in london in a handsome house with every comfort about you you were in such a fury you were ready to murder your brother you wicked cain you and what good would have come of remaining angry all the rage in the world won't get us your aunt's money and it is much better that we should be friends with your brother's family than enemies as those foolish buttes are when your father dies queen's crawley will be a pleasant house for you and me to pass the winter in if we are ruined you can carve and take charge of the stable and i can be governess to lady jane's children ruined <laughs> fiddle-de-dee i will get you a good place before that or pitt and his little boy will die and we will be sir rawdon and my lady while there is life there is hope my dear and i intend to make a man of you yet who sold your horses for you who paid your debts for you rawdon was obliged to confess that he owed all these benefits to his wife and to trust himself to her guidance for the future indeed when miss crawley quitted the world and that money for which all her relatives had been fighting so eagerly was finally left to pitt bute crawley who found that only five thousand pounds had been left to him instead of the twenty upon which he calculated was in such a fury at his disappointment that he vented it in savage abuse upon his nephew and the quarrel always rankling between them ended in an utter breach of intercourse rawdon crawley's conduct on the other hand 
who got but a hundred pounds was such as to astonish his brother and delight his sister-in-law who was disposed to look kindly upon all the members of her husband's family he wrote to his brother a very frank manly good-humoured letter from paris he was aware he said that by his own marriage he had forfeited his aunt's favour and though he did not disguise his disappointment that she should have been so entirely relentless towards him he was glad that the money was still kept in their branch of the family and heartily congratulated his brother on his good fortune he sent his affectionate remembrances to his sister and hoped to have her good will for mrs rawdon and the letter concluded with a postscript to pitt in the latter lady's own handwriting she too begged to join in her husband's congratulations she should ever remember mr crawley's kindness to her in the early days when she was a friendless orphan the instructress of his little sisters in whose welfare she still took the tenderest interest she wished him every happiness in his married life and asking his permission to offer her remembrances to lady jane of whose goodness all the world informed her she hoped that one day she might be allowed to present her little boy to his uncle and aunt and begged to bespeak for him their good will and protection pitt crawley received this communication very graciously more graciously than miss crawley had received some of rebecca's previous compositions in rawdon's handwriting and as for lady jane she was so charmed with the letter that she expected her husband would instantly divide his aunt's legacy into two equal portions and send off one half to his brother at paris to her ladyship's surprise however pitt declined to accommodate his brother with a cheque for thirty thousand pounds but he made rawdon a handsome offer of his hand whenever the latter should come to england and choose to take it and thanking mrs crawley for her good opinion of himself and lady jane he graciously pronounced his willingness to take any opportunity to serve her little boy thus an almost reconciliation was brought about between the brothers when rebecca came to town pitt and his wife were not in london many a time she drove by the old door in park lane to see whether they had taken possession of miss crawley's house there but the new family did not make its appearance it was only through raggles that she heard of their movements how miss crawley's domestics had been dismissed with decent gratuities and how mr pitt had only once made his appearance in london when he stopped for a few days at the house did business with his lawyers there and sold off all miss crawley's french novels to a bookseller out of bond street becky had reasons of her own which caused her to long for the arrival of her new relation when lady jane comes thought she she shall be my sponsor in london society and as for the women ha, the women will ask me when they find the men want to see me an article as necessary to a lady in this position as her brougham or her bouquet is her companion i have always admired the way in which the tender creatures who cannot exist without sympathy hire an exceedingly plain friend of their own sex from whom they are almost inseparable the sight of that inevitable woman in her faded gown seated behind her dear friend in the opera box or occupying the back seat of the barouche is always a wholesome and moral one to me as jolly a reminder as that of the death's head which figured in the repasts of egyptian bon vivants a strange sardonic memorial of vanity fair what even battered brazen beautiful conscienceless heartless mrs firebrace whose father died of her shame even lovely daring mrs mantrap who will ride at any fence which any man in england will take and who drives her greys in the park while her mother keeps a huckster's stall in bath still even those who are so bold one might fancy they could face anything dare not face the world without a female friend they must have somebody to cling to the affectionate creatures and you will hardly see them in any public place without a shabby companion in a dyed silk sitting somewhere in the shade close behind them rawdon 
said becky very late one night as a party of gentlemen were seated round her crackling drawing-room fire for the men came to her house to finish the night and she had ice and coffee for them the best in london i must have a sheep-dog oh what said rawdon looking up from the ecarte table a sheep-dog said young lord southdown my dear mrs crawley what a fancy why not have a danish dog i know of one as big as a camel leopard by jove it would almost pull your broom or a persian greyhound eh i propose if you please or a little pug that would go into one of lord steyne's snuff-boxes there's a man at bayswater got one with such a nose that you might i mark the king and play that you might hang your hat on it i mark the trick rawdon gravely said he attended to his game commonly and didn't much meddle with the conversation except when it was about horses and betting what can you want with a shepherd's dog the lively little southdown continued i mean a moral shepherd's dog said becky laughing and looking up at lord steyne what the devil's that said his lordship a dog to keep the wolves off me rebecca continued a companion dear little innocent lamb you want one said the marquis and his jaw thrust out and he began to grin hideously his little eyes leering towards rebecca the great lord of steyne was standing by the fire sipping coffee the fire crackled and blazed pleasantly there was a score of candles sparkling round the mantelpiece in all sorts of quaint sconces of gilt and bronze and porcelain they lighted up rebecca's figure to admiration as she sat on a sofa covered with a pattern of gaudy flowers she was in a pink dress that looked as fresh as a rose her dazzling white arms and shoulders were half covered with a thin hazy scarf through which they sparkled her hair hung in curls round her neck one of her little feet peeped out from the fresh crisp folds of the silk the prettiest little foot in the prettiest little sandal in the finest silk stocking in the world the candles lighted up lord steyne's shining bald head which was fringed with red hair he had thick bushy eyebrows with little twinkling bloodshot eyes surrounded by a thousand wrinkles his jaw was underhung and when he laughed two white buck teeth protruded themselves and glistened savagely in the midst of the grin he had been dining with royal personages and wore his garter and ribbon a short man was his lordship broad-chested and bow-legged but proud of the fineness of his foot and ankle and always caressing his garter knee and so the shepherd is not enough said he to defend his lambkin the shepherd is too fond of playing at cards and going to his clubs answered becky laughing gad what a debauched corridon said my lord what a mouth for a pipe i take your three to two here said rawdon at the card-table hark at melibius snarled the noble marquis he's pastorally occupied too he's shearing a southdown what an innocent mutton eh dammy what a snowy fleece rebecca's eyes shot out gleams of scornful humour my lord she said you are a knight of the order he had the collar round his neck indeed a gift of the restored princes of spain lord steyne in early life had been notorious for his daring and his success at play he had sat up two days and two nights with mr fox at hazard he had won money of the most august personages of the realm he had won his marquisate it was said at the gaming-table but he did not like an allusion to those bygone fridanes rebecca saw the scowl gathering over his heavy brow she rose up from her sofa and went and took his coffee-cup out of his hand with a little curtsey yes she said i must get a watch-dog but he won't bark at you and going into the other drawing-room she sat down to the piano 
and began to sing little French songs in such a charming, thrilling voice that the mollified nobleman speedily followed her into that chamber, and might be seen nodding his head and bowing time over her. Rawdon and his friend, meanwhile, played écarte until they had enough. The colonel won, but say that he won ever so much and often nights like these which occurred many times in the week his wife having all the talk and all the admiration and he sitting silent without the circle not comprehending a word of the jokes the allusions the mystical language within must have been rather wearisome to the ex-dragoon how is mrs crawley's husband lord steyne used to say to him by way of a good day when they met and indeed that was now his avocation in life he was colonel crawley no more he was mrs crawley's husband about the little rawdon if nothing has been said all this while it is because he is hidden upstairs in a garret somewhere or has crawled below into the kitchen for companionship his mother scarcely ever took notice of him he passed the days with his french bonne as long as that domestic remained in mr crawley's family and when the frenchwoman went away the little fellow howling in the loneliness of the night had compassion taken on him by a housemaid who took him out of his solitary nursery into her bed in the garret hard by and comforted him rebecca my lord steyne and one or two more were in the drawing-room taking tea after the opera when this shouting was heard overhead it's my cherub crying for his nurse she said she did not offer to move to go and see the child don't agitate your feelings by going to look for him said lord steyne sardonically bah replied the other with a sort of blush he'll cry himself to sleep and they fell to talking about the opera rawdon had stolen off though to look after his son and heir and came back to the company when he found the honest dolly was consoling the child the colonel's dressing-room was in those upper regions he used to see the boy there in private they had interviews together every morning when he shaved rawdon minor sitting on a box by his father's side and watching the operation with never-ceasing pleasure he and the sire were great friends the father would bring him sweetmeats from the dessert and hide them in a certain old epaulette box where the child went to seek them and laughed with joy on discovering the treasure laughed but not too loud for mamma was below asleep and must not be disturbed she did not go to rest till very late and seldom rose till afternoon rawdon brought the boy plenty of picture books and crammed his nursery with toys its walls were covered with pictures pasted up by the father's own hand and purchased by him for ready money when he was off duty with mrs rawdon in the park he would sit up here passing hours with the boy who rode on his chest who pulled his great moustachios as if they were driving reins and spent days with him in indefatigable gambols the room was a low room and once when the child was not five years old his father who was tossing him wildly up in his arms hit the poor little chap's skull so violently against the ceiling that he almost dropped the child so terrified was he at the disaster rawdon minor had just made up his face for a tremendous howl the severity of the blow indeed authorised that indulgence but just as he was going to begin the father interposed for god's sake rawdy don't wake mamma he cried and the child looking in a very hard and piteous way at his father bit his lips clenched his hands and didn't cry a bit rawdon told that story at the clubs at the mess to everybody in town by gad sir he explained to the public in general what a good plucked one that boy of mine is what a trump he is i half sent his head through the ceiling by gad and he wouldn't cry for fear of disturbing his mother sometimes once or twice in a week that lady visited the upper regions in which the child lived she came like a vivified figure out of the magasin des modes 
blandly smiling in the most beautiful new clothes and little gloves and boots wonderful scarves laces and jewels glittered about her she had always a new bonnet on and flowers bloomed perpetually in it or else magnificent curling ostrich feathers soft and snowy as camellias she nodded twice or thrice patronisingly to the little boy who looked up from his dinner or from the pictures of soldiers he was painting when she left the room an odour of rose or some other magical fragrance lingered about the nursery she was an unearthly being in his eyes superior to his father to all the world to be worshipped and admired at a distance to drive with that lady in the carriage was an awful right he sat up in the back seat and did not dare to speak he gazed with all his eyes at the beautifully dressed princess opposite to him gentlemen on splendid prancing horses came up and smiled and talked with her how her eyes beamed upon all of them her hand used to quiver and wave gracefully as they passed when he went out with her he had his new red dress on his old brown holland was good enough when he stayed at home sometimes when she was away and dolly his maid was making his bed he came into his mother's room it was as the abode of a fairy to him a mystic chamber of splendour and delights there in the wardrobe hung those wonderful robes pink and blue and many tinted there was the jewel case silver clasped and the wondrous bronze hand on the dressing-table glistening all over with a hundred rings there was the cheval glass that miracle of art in which he could just see his own wandering head and the reflection of dolly queerly distorted and as if up in the ceiling plumping and patting the pillows of the bed oh thou poor lonely little benighted boy mother is the name for god in the lips and hearts of little children and here was one who was worshipping a stone now rawdon crawley rascal as the colonel was had certain manly tendencies of affection in his heart and could love a child and a woman still for rawdon minor he had a great secret tenderness then which did not escape rebecca though she did not talk about it to her husband it did not annoy her she was too good-natured it only increased her scorn for him he felt somehow ashamed of this paternal softness and hid it from his wife only indulging in it when alone with the boy he used to take him out of mornings when they would go to the stables together and to the park little lord southdown the best-natured of men who would make you a present of the hat from his head and whose main occupation in life was to buy knick-knacks that he might give them away afterwards brought the little chap a pony not much bigger than a large rat the donor said and on this little black shetland pigmy young rawdon's great father was pleased to mount the boy and to walk by his side in the park it pleased him to see his old quarters and his old fellow guardsmen at knightsbridge he had begun to think of his bachelorhood with something like regret the old troopers were glad to recognise their ancient officer and dandle the little colonel colonel crawley found dining at mess and with his brother officers very pleasant hang it i ain't clever enough for her i know it she won't miss me he used to say and he was right his wife did not miss him rebecca was fond of her husband she was always perfectly good-humoured and kind to him she did not even show her scorn much for him perhaps she liked him the better for being a fool he was her upper servant and maitre d'hotel he went on her errands obeyed her orders without question drove the carriage in the ring with her without repining took her to the opera box solaced himself at his club during the performance and came punctually back to fetch her when due he would have liked her to be a little fonder of the boy but even to that he reconciled himself 
hang it you know she's so clever he said and i'm not literary and that you know for as we have said before it requires no great wisdom to be able to win at cards and billiards and rawdon made no pretensions to any other sort of skill when the companion came his domestic duties became very light his wife encouraged him to dine abroad she would let him off duty at the opera don't stay and stupefy yourself at home to-night my dear she would say some men are coming who will only bore you i would not ask them but you know it's for your good and now i have a sheep-dog i need not be afraid to be alone a sheep-dog a companion becky sharp with a companion isn't it good fun thought mrs crawley to herself the notion tickled hugely her sense of humour one sunday morning as rawdon crawley his little son and the pony were taking their accustomed walk in the park they passed by an old acquaintance of the colonel's corporal clink of the regiment who was in conversation with a friend an old gentleman who held a boy in his arms about the age of little rawdon this other youngster had seized hold of the waterloo medal which the corporal wore and was examining it with delight good morning your honour said clink in reply to the how do clink of the colonel this here young gentleman is about the little colonel's age sir continued the corporal his father was a waterloo man too said the old gentleman who carried the boy wasn't he georgie yes said georgie he and the little chap on the pony were looking at each other with all their might solemnly scanning each other as children do in a line regiment clink said with a patronising air he was a captain in the nth regiment said the old gentleman rather pompously captain george osborne sir perhaps you knew him he died the death of a hero sir fighting against the corsican tyrant colonel crawley blushed quite red i knew him very well sir he said and his wife his dear little wife sir how is she she is my daughter sir said the old gentleman putting down the boy and taking out a card with great solemnity which he handed to the colonel on it written mr sedley sole agent for the black diamond and anti cinder coal association bunker's wharf thames street and anna maria cottages fulham road west little georgie went up and looked at the shetland pony should you like to have a ride said rawdon minor from the saddle yes said georgie the colonel who had been looking at him with some interest took up the child and put him on the pony behind rawdon minor take hold of him georgie he said take my little boy round the waist his name is rawdon and both the children began to laugh you won't see a prettier pair i think this summer's day sir said the good-natured corporal and the colonel the corporal and old mr sedley with his umbrella walked by the side of the children End of chapter 37